So if we think about what happens to inequality in this process, we can see that if we move from A, right, so remember these are the Lorentz curves, and so what's going on at point A is that we have a certain number of unemployed workers that aren't earning any income. The workers are earning a fixed share of the income depending on uh, the uh, mu, the markup, and then the firm owners are getting uh, the rest, right? That's their profits, that's their markup. If we move to point D, then we get an increased number of unemployed. So now we have an increased number of people who aren't getting any income. We have a lower wage um, because uh, of the higher unemployment rate, right? And so now we have an increase in profits. And that means that inequality has increased, right? We have more workers earning zero, the workers who are worker, uh, working earning less, and uh, the firm owners getting more. And so the Lorentz curve has shifted out and the Gini coefficient has gone up. As we move back to B, right, as more firms enter, as the wage starts going up, well, now we have fewer uh, workers who are unemployed because the unemployment rate went down. They're still getting that same share of income, although remember their income has gone up. Uh, and so the inequality, the level of inequality has decreased by a little bit because of the fewer workers who are unemployed, um, but mostly it's gone back to where it was, but everybody is better off because of the new uh, increase in technology. So I feel like right now we want to think about how long is the long run because it feels like we might be in a situation, you know, over the last 40 years where inequality has been increasing. Um, is that because of, uh, you know, new technology? Um, is it because we've had this big, you know, Chinese import shock? Um, and so, you know, most economists, I think, would have thought that we would sort of adjust back to the long run by now. Um, but what we've seen recently is more evidence that, the, you know, when we think of this, the shock of Chinese imports, so a lot of production moving from the United States to China, um, that you know, more than 2 million jobs were lost and the labor market is still adjusting. And so uh, when that is the case, there can be a lack of political support for these uh, technological improvements. We, so we looked at this picture uh, before and we saw that there were, you know, big differences between how well countries uh, balanced average long-run unemployment rates and average real wage growth, right? And so we have a lot of countries sort of here in the middle that do a pretty good job of both. Uh, Norway and Japan doing very well with low unemployment rates and high real wage growth. And then a bunch of countries over here that haven't been doing that well. So the U.S. has had pretty low unemployment rates but pretty weak wage growth since 1970. Whereas Spain has had, you know, pretty high wage growth, but very high unemployment. And so if we're a country as in one of the low performers, how do we get to be closer to the high performers, right? What are those institutions that are important that can get us both low unemployment rates and high wage growth? And so there are a number of important factors. Um, institutions are definitely, you know, important. Uh, including inclusive trade unions. And so trade unions come in a lot of uh, different flavors. And so what the book means by inclusive trade unions is unions that represent you know, many firms and sectors. So you might have a union that represents a whole industry um, and as opposed to a union that just represents a narrow uh, group of workers in you know, one or two uh, companies. Those would be called more exclusive trade unions, right? Where they're, they're only worried about their unions in that narrow company, whereas an inclusive trade union has to worry about the whole industry. And so because they have to worry about the whole industry, they might not want to push their wages up too high because they know that that could uh, affect job creation and job destruction. And so we've seen that in the United States where we've had fairly exclusive trade unions and they benefited workers for a long time but then they made costs so high in the 60s and 70s that those firms uh, really struggled to compete. You know, firms like GM, Ford, uh, U.S. Steel, uh, they, they, they struggled to compete on a global scale when uh, the other countries started to develop. 
Policies are also going to be very important too. So well-designed unemployment insurance schemes. So how do you help workers that have lost their jobs, but not give them bad incentives to not go find new jobs, um, job placement services, things like that. So there's obviously no magic formula. So if we looked at Norway and Japan, they do things very differently as does, you know, the United States and Spain. Um, but we can look at which countries have been successful and which countries have not. So two examples that uh, were successful, which we already talked about, were Norway and Japan. So Norway has very inclusive trade unions, um, as does, say, a country like Germany. Um, and so trade unions and employers associations uh, bargain over wages, uh, but they look at you know, the productivity of labor. And, and they're also supported by policies from the government uh, that shift the wage setting curve uh, downwards so that uh, we can have uh, lower long run unemployment. In Japan, things are somewhat different. It's not so much unions, at least they're not called unions, um, but they, they're employers associations that work uh, to coordinate wages across firms and there are sort of employee groups that uh, are pretty strong. And so corporations uh, deliberately don't compete in hiring workers and so wages tend to be lower and that might hurt workers in terms of their wage gains, but it tends to help workers in terms of the unemployment rate. And so often what you'll see is that in a recession, corporations won't lay off workers in Japan the way they do in the United States, um, but they might not have as high uh, wage growth as the United States does during expansions. Spain has kind of got the worst of both worlds. So they have sort of non-inclusive unions, so exclusive unions that sort of only look out for their own interests and government legislation that project, protects specific jobs rather than workers. Um, and so, you know, they've ended up with almost always the highest unemployment rate uh, in, in Europe um, and really sort of poor performance overall. So one thing we can look at is the employees covered by uh, union wage bargains. Um, so how, you know, what percentage of workers are covered by um, CBAs and the unemployment rate average. So these are, uh, this is a 2000 to 2014 average. So you can see, you know, some countries like Korea, Switzerland, Norway, the Netherlands, they've had fairly low unemployment rates. Spain, Slovakia, Poland uh, have had higher unemployment rates. And there really just is no relationship between unions and long run unemployment rates, right? You can have really strong unions that cover almost all workers and have really low unemployment rates. Um, or you can have exclusive unions that cover almost all workers and have really high unemployment rates like Spain. You can have really high unemployment rates with really weak unions and you can have really low unemployment rates with weak unions. So uh, there's really no relationship. You know, so you often hear that, oh, unions are just, they destroy the labor markets. Um, and lead to high unemployment. That really depends on the type of unions and the other institutions within the economy. If we look at the beverage curves in Norway and Spain, we can see there's this huge difference between uh, Norway and Spain, where Spain has a really flat beverage curve. And so when the Great Recession hit, which was really a Great Depression for Spain, unemployment increased you know, dramatically and you know, was at Great Depression levels um, of 25%. I mean, it's still really high. I think it's about 18 or 19 percent uh, still. Whereas Norway, uh, which, you know, was experiencing the same recession, uh, did not have a huge increase in the unemployment rate. They had a drop in vacancies, but no big increase in the unemployment rate because of the inclusiveness of their unions. Uh, and so that was a big difference. So if we think about those changing labor market performances, you know, the Netherlands and UK both had high unemployment rates in the 1970s, along with a lot of other countries. That was due both to the oil price shocks that we've talked about before and uh, an increase in uh, young workers due to the baby boom. Um, and they both managed to shift the wage setting curve down. The Netherlands uh, did it more through institutions becoming more inclusive, similar to Norway, whereas the UK really took uh, and decreased the power of their non-inclusive unions, more similar to the United States, right? So that was really what was going on in the US. We had very, we had more powerful, but more exclusive unions in the US uh, and their power was greatly reduced in the 1970s and early 1980s 
um, which may have shifted the, the U.S. wage setting curve down as 